Good evening all. Welcome to another King's Crusher radio show. So it's Tuesday, it's a bit later than usual, sorry about that. Uh, we're going to have a look at two key games from the 1970s, the best of the best from the 1970s. Uh, the first one is Spassky against Fisher from that amazing 1972 match. Uh, let's flip the board. Fisher played very unusually in the opening. Let's, let's turn off, let's mute there. Okay. And let's add a bit, sir, actually. And uh, into line book, Go into line book as well. Okay, so e4 from Boris Baski. This was game 13 of the 1972 match. So Fisher chose the Alakine defense, knight f6, quite provocative. So considering he was like a vast exponent of Sicilian defence. This is kind of in the psychological style of the match. Some some of the openings were really surprise openings. So he was bypassing a lot of the preparation that must have been done against him. So the Anakine defence and Spassky plays directly to kick the knight main line d4 now d6 knight f3. G6, bishop c4, and the knight goes back to b6, bishop b3, bishop g7. So this is quite a provocative opening, not seen at very high levels much anymore, the Alakine defense. Uh, I think because there's ways of white getting a small definite edge without going having to go all out to try and bust black up. So uh, we see um, here knight bd2, eight, uh, black castles h3, depriving the bishop the g4 square a5 and now uh yeah it seems this is a concern to try and win the light square bishop and you might think um yeah either a3 or a4 could, could be uh to use to parry that a4 was was used is the pawn a target though is it a significant enough target later on let's see uh in this position d takes e5 d takes e5 Knight a6, as though there's an idea already of targeting this poor a pawn with knight c5 and the bishop at the same time. So black already has done quite well at the opening. It's it's a surprise thing to play against Pasky, and he's he's done quite well. Uh, this looks like a nice position to have with black. Knight c5, we have queen e2 offering uh, that light square bishop. If it is taken here, I think white should be solid enough though after knight takes there, there is this central pawn wedge maybe rook d1 and etc so uh oh okay but uh yeah bishop didn't take that bishop even though it might seem lucrative he actually put more pressure on a4 and sidestepped any any potential harassment on that d4 later so a4 under great scrutiny Knight e4, just letting the a pawn go. So it's a, some sort of, it's a positional gambit. My Spassky is judging the compensation should be pretty good here. Uh, some sort of king attack could be whipped up maybe. And Fisher does take this pawn a little bit like materialistically. This poor a pawn is taken. We have bishop takes a4. So that's, the, that's there's other interesting choices here. Maybe just preserving the bishop is. Is interesting bishop c4 uh, but yeah we're in okay bishop takes a4 knight takes a4 rookie one we have knight b6 bishop d2 a4 so holding on to that pawn bishop g5 you can see there's a lot of pressure on the black position but is there any concrete threats here there's a nice pawn wedge nice pressure if black Maybe plays f6 is asking for trouble because you'd think that the lines opened here would favor white. Black hasn't got too much coordination. Fisher played h6. If he played f6, let's just for the sake of argument have a look at this for a moment. I think this just loses. Yeah, knight takes f6, we just lose on the spot because of queen takes e8. There's too much disconnection here at the moment. So, very cautious plays needed here in that respect. So, just h6 asking the bishop to move. It does create some potential weaknesses. Bishop h4, keeping the bishop around. Bishop f5. 
and now it lashes out actually with g4 they might think that might be a sniff of some weaknesses later g4 it might have some uh, indications later bishop e6 wanting to keep that bishop and also there's a bishop c4 spotted by the knight knight d4 and bishop c4 is used queen d2 queen d7 nice pin there and here actually yeah it seems as though fish is solving his problems a little bit uh, rook f8 he seems solid enough for the moment f4 yeah Spassky's like going all out to squish him f4 okay bishop d5 knight c5 queen goes back queen c3 now on this diagonal you might think is not an issue at the moment but it could be an issue later so queen c3 might be a little bit on the, the suspect side because it is going to the gaze of an x-ray that's kind of I don't know tactically it's it's not it doesn't seem significant at the moment but let's have a look there might be alternatives here maybe in fact there is an engine choice queen c3 uh, what is black actually threatening knight c4 maybe and then a3 maybe that's the that's the intention knight c4 and a3 I wonder if we can put the bishop somewhere else though queen f2 maybe or just b3 just to stop knight c4 maybe this is okay this position here there seems to be fair enough uh, compensation for the pawn but anyway we see queen c3 at the moment it doesn't look as though it should have any any suspect uh, indication here tactically but uh, let's see e6 king h2 knight d7 knight d3 and now c5 knight b6 and now queen c6 and actually yeah i think this was a mistake this is all getting to be a bit dodgy now because after queen c6 knight d6 can you see what fisher played here black to play here yeah i think i might have given the clue earlier so Fisher to play. Guess what he plays? I've given definitely. I've given a clue earlier. I hope you can all see it. Yeah. Oh, Kremlin student. Hi there. Is that Kremlin student from uh, another site? I played quite a bit. Hi there. Queen takes d6. Yeah, exploiting that. Yeah, that issue from earlier. That X-ray has actually come to life now in the position. Uh, sometimes they do. There's sometimes a particular configuration which comes more quickly than you might expect to exploit what was a theoretical issue. Now is a totally practical issue. On the board so it simplifies it for black and also at the same time now gives black uh, what seems to be a promising outside pass pawn we see uh, white though with still very significant pressure in this position uh, f6 is played to deprive knight e5 it seems g5 to try and puncture that e5 square that's taken which gives black that potential h file as well but mind you that's a two-way street sometimes maybe f takes f5 at least blocking getting the bishop to be blocked by its own pawn but yeah white's grip on e5 is evident here bishop g3 and white keeps a, an even stronger lock on the e5 square king f7 as though this this might be handy at some point it's also of course protecting e6 we have the check so we've got opposite color bishop scenario and you think with opposite color bishops this actual pawn might not be the, that significant and also we've got this strong pass pawn here so we've got two pass pawns opposite colored bishops semi out of an h4 but it's dominant it's controlled by that bishop at the moment uh, so in fact it's a very interesting position here we have b5 as they're trying to make the most out of these pawns rook f1 and now fisher plays a very interesting decision indeed rook h8 offering an exchange sacrifice that isn't taken up because actually that would give black what seems to be a very promising position indeed bishop f6 was played if uh, bishop takes h8 rook takes h8 this this does seem as though the pawn's going to be surrounded and if here yeah i think this is 
thought to be uh, it looks better for black yeah these pawns are dangerous there's enough compensation here uh, if that pawn goes if it doesn't I mean what what else does white do uh, yeah I think black's doing well here and might actually uh, take on h3 soon or play a2 so yeah uh, that's an interesting continuation to take on h8 but so yeah Spassky didn't take it up it does seem as though it's just favorable for black so bishop f6 which makes sure okay the king can't come and surround this pawn that easily a3 rook f4 a2 past pawns are meant to be pushed uh, so c4 very interesting uh, to try and yeah if b takes uh, I think the idea is d7 and it gets very interesting I mean the game continuation is very interesting so let's just go with the game bishop takes d7 yeah it looks as though white's playing to queen this pawn uh, bishop d5 king g3 check c3 and now rook over here so really threatening uh, not at the moment because of this this pawn it's not really threatening uh, the, the the bigger threat is to play e5 and, and king e6 actually maybe uh, although yeah this this could have some some dangerous implications as well okay Spassky played rook h4 and it looks dangerous this infiltration uh, we have e5 check check and it gets a bit crazy this bishop is being sacked Rook takes c3 for an avalanche of pawns. So a bishop sack for an avalanche of pawns. Check. And taking off that other dangerous pawn. So loads of pawns for the for a whole bishop though. Very interesting position. And the king can run away here. If if the rooks try and harass the king, I think the king can actually come over here. Uh, check. This wasn't tested. This check wasn't tested. And also of course there's rook c1 and a1 if if we go with check I think king yeah that's forced basically but black is is just better here this position black's just better this king's gonna come over here it's quite nice and get his bishop back and he's still got loads of pawns so uh, that check wasn't uh, tried we have this one now this bishop is keeping an eye on a1 at the moment rook takes d2 King takes b4, so we've got these three connected pass pawns. Pretty dramatic scenario. h4, king b5, h5, and Fisher just progresses his own pawns, trying to blunt this bishop away from a1. Rook a1, before that disconnection happens, uh, the, the rook's able to hold on to that pawn. g takes, g6, h4, another pass pawn over here, trying to distract the bishop. Uh, and I think it's fatal if this bishop took, I mean, it's fatal. Well, it's winning for black after rook g8. You can give up that pawn disposition is very good for black. So actually, uh, we have g7, h3, bishop e7, and this is the threat now. Bishop f8, try and queen. Rook tries to stop that, and now it's the pawns versus the rook. All these pawns versus this rook. Very dramatic scenario. Um, now here, uh, yeah, the rook's tied down. Clearly, we have king c2, king c6, and technically, engine suggests this might be an equal position with absolute best play. In the game, I think a blunder occurred at some point soon, coming soon. Uh, so this king, this this pawn was sacked for this king to walk across in dramatic fashion. Check king e4, yeah, king d3. It seems here it's engines giving rook c3 is equal we might have covered this before at some point it might technically be equal with absolute best play uh, but in the game uh, actually so after king d3 rook d1 check was played and this gives it seems immediately black a decisive advantage so yeah it was essential it seems this is a critical moment it was essential to play rook c3 check um, I think, yeah we've, we've analyzed this at some point before in depth uh, just 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 have a go at this again it, yeah I think it might just be if f3 takes uh, and there's not enough to win this it seems uh, not quite enough to win it so okay 
So rook d1 check was played, which allows Fisher to break through with his king. And now f3, the, the rook is really getting overwhelmed. Bishop c5, which releases this rook. Rook takes g7. Rook takes c4. f2 is also interesting as well as what was played, which is rook d7. We have check. King f1. Bishop d4. f2. And here, uh, white actually resigns. So move 74, quite a grueling game. I'll give you an example continuation. Uh, if rook f4, rook takes d4, and the king's tied down, can't ever take on b3. So just this kind of move. And let's see. It's it's going to be winning for black. Yeah, here. It's going to be queening. we got a queen coming along. So yeah, a very intense um, Alakine defense game. Uh, shows the psychological war that was going on as well in terms of openings <laughs> and uh, yeah so sometimes openings can be uh, making a psychological statement I think this was to avoid a lot of preparation and Fisher just managed to get nearly uh, an equal position out of the opening and now being that a pawn put white on 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 the sort of side of having to prove compensation. Fisher wasn't going to play any rash move getting obliterated that easily. So he played very carefully and offered an exchange sacrifice at one point and offered the bishop at another point. Very interesting dynamics there. Very, very complex game. Very complex. Okay, uh, let's go on to game two. I hope you got something from that uh, revision of that game. So game two Okay, this is Anatoly Karpov against Unzuka. I think this is considered by many as one of Karpov's classic uh, games. So we have e4 from Karpov, e5. Let's take white side, not biased or anything to Karpov. Knight f3, knight c6, or maybe I am. Bishop b5, Roy Lopez. So it's a classic Roy Lopez. Started off as this classic Roy Lopez, very tried and tested, tested territory. Uh, we go into um, what's known as I believe the Shigorin, uh defense soon no it doesn't seem like Shigorin. I think this has been misclassified uh, let's see c5 d4 oh yeah maybe it is queen c7 this apparently is Shigorin defense this line uh, with 11 d4 queen c7 knight bd2 knight c6 Shigorin defense Chigorin. d5 white gain space knight d8 a4, trying to work with that A file, rook b8. A takes, and now white tries to fix those pawns on the queen side. Black is not tempted yet with c4. Knight f1, bishop d7, bishop e3, rook a8, queen d2, rook fc8, bishop d3. I have actually annotated this game in detail, by the way, uh, on the channel. You can actually find it on my channel with a much greater analysis in detail if you wanted. Uh, this is just a brief overview, I, I should warn you. Brief overview overview, and revision. <laughs> so knight g3, these knights are poised for something, but where is white's pawn break on the king's side? Does white need a pawn break on the king's side? Rook a2, c4. Now this is interesting, this c4, because it does give white technically access to a7. And you might think, well, how is that significant? And here is the remarkable move, which for me, is an iconic Karpovian uh, move which helps write opening books on how you could try and gain control of a file. So I think this is one of the most instructive Karpov games and th this move in particular is how how you would try and gain control of a file. Uh, can you see what is Karpov's move, positional move? Can you try and guess it? So there's a positional move here, which is uh, very interesting. And you might not get like 
the purpose of it it's profound <laughs> and the word profound shouldn't be used all the time but it's kind of profound <laughs> it's it's uh yeah for the follow-up it's it's kind of cl neat clever and in fact it sets up the precursor for a second offensive on the king side i'm looking at the game score in advance it re really sets up things for opening a second front later so I think many people regard this as one of Karpov's greatest iconic positional moves. And it's bishop a7. What it really does, well, a few things. It maintains the tension. The rooks are not simply, a pair of rooks are not simply going to come off in a great draw. White has now the opportunity uh, to, with that superior bishop, because you look at that bishop that's a bit blocked in, to actually build behind that bishop to double rooks, and then maybe open the second front on the king side with later f4. So let's see this plan in action. So knight e8, bishop c2, white can prepare to double the rooks now. And um, is there a concrete threat here? Maybe not yet. It just ties black down for a moment. Bishop b1, slightly improving the position. Knight e2, knight h2, and there might be a second front opening here because black's pieces are a bit on the passive side. This pawn chain is definitely a space advantage, keeping the knights out of things. Uh, we have bishop g7, and now white dares to open a second front. Now, often this is a controversial move because it's giving up that e5 square, but it's played here anyway. Um, so let's see why why wouldn't it be that bad for black to take he didn't actually he let himself be squished a bit with f6 so why didn't he take because usually a natural reaction would be to try and get this e5 square he actually uh took oh no sorry he didn't take that's the point if he did take let's have a look knight takes f4 which potentially does run into a self pin you'd think i don't think this self pin works let's rule that out knight takes g6 is is a tactic it doesn't work yeah that's a disaster for black. So the self pin is not something to be worry, uh, worrying about. Is e5 something to be worrying about here? If bishop e5, knight f3. I think the, the point is this bishop can't really be exchanged off without underlining the weaknesses on the dark squares. It doesn't really want to be exchanged off. I mean, white will be interested in taking that and then later playing something like bishop b6. And we'll have an infiltration point on a7 as well as dark square weaknesses to look forward to later so i'm not sure bishop e5 the problem is the knights in relation to e5 in this particular configuration they're quite far away quite often in benoni's say it'll be a lovely place for a knight but here it doesn't seem as though either of these knights is able to really make this an exploitable central strong square to make use out of so maybe that's why that the very passive looking f6 was played it seems nothing was really uh and and zika thanks and zika okay uh and zika um yeah this passive looking move was played and white gains even more space and it seems as though black's really cramped now we have bishop f7 knight g3 bishop b uh knight b7 bishop d1 which locks down the h5 square and if this can be exchanged off yeah these light squares look a bit potentially weak and that's that's the second like strategic plan now but yeah to be to be fair yeah it seems black might have just been playing a little bit more passively than usual to get this this state of affairs as well uh so it's starting to be like strangled on both sides of the board and you can see these advanced bishops they're kind of what are these advanced bishops really doing on both sides of the board? They're kind of keeping black locked down. Is that one way of putting it? They're keeping black locked down on both sides of the board. And you can see black is without any strategic pawn breaks to look forward to. So it's like the, hope's been, the hope has been taken out of the position. If pawns are the sole chest, this is quite a miserable position because this bishop is not particularly happy either. It's the pieces are just not very happy. The knights haven't got squares. The the bishop's pretty dead here. Everything's pretty passive. Okay, knight d8, rook a3, king f8. Just this prepares an alakine's gun, potentially. But uh, I don't think that's actually used now. We see instead 
the tactical knight g4 which relies on the king's exact position here on g8 so bishop takes h8 is not played this is not played because it would run into knight takes f6 check winning the queen so that's that's why that's able to be played now knight g4 we have king f8 and now the strangulation knight e3 king j and now that's taken off and in fact uh, black took with the knight not the queen if he took with the queen uh, then bishop b6 strikes nasty stuff about black here with rook a7 to follow okay so this you see an infiltration which is really significant now if if say here i think yeah this is just nasty this position because i think white is threatening knight h5 and you can see that rook is actually contacting the other pieces here so that kind of thing could happen on queen takes f7 this bishop b6 could be strong there so we see knight takes f7 uh, now queen h5 knight d8 and now white just plays queen g6 he would love to get a knight to f5 and you can see that this basic plan still exists of trying to get an infiltration on the seventh to help the queen king f8 and now knight h5 and black actually on move 44 resigned here so yeah black didn't help himself he played a bit too passively without too much counterplay so why would he resign here i think it's because really bishop b6 and rook a7 if we look at queen f7 here perish the thought of queen g6 because then you know knight f5 is huge so you can see that's just horrible but let's imagine uh queen f7 bishop b6 i think is is going to be crushing uh say a pair of rooks come off there's rook a7 coming in here if knight uh, a8 there's still rook a7 and making contacts over here and this is just fatal if, you know for example this we've got g7 now targeted so it doesn't matter about this because uh, uh rook takes g7 is is totally winning uh with the idea of knight f5 yeah so that's just a totally winning position it hinges on bishop b6 being a key move here um the earlier positional play on the queen side made it made it really that yeah you have to be always watching out for the queen side infiltration to help the king side attack this is this is just miserable so it's understandable that he didn't really want to play this out it's just a very very passive uh position if queen takes g6 you can see that this is just a nightmare it's this, this is it's better to resign sometimes than play on such positions yeah with white's dominance of the a file so yeah he he resigned you might think um without asking for proof but yeah i think there was sufficient proof positionally if you're playing against Karpov especially so uh yeah that was a very nice positional game uh ending on knight h5 there so yeah i hope uh, you got something from this game as well i think it really I think it went into middle game books how you would uh, make use of an infiltration point uh, to give yourself the option of infiltrating at some point opening a second front having resources over here which you can somehow connect your resources on the queen side to your king side at, at the most appropriate point so it was a great positional and attacking game actually on both sides of the board but black yeah unfortunately yeah he, he just got into a very passive state but there does seem to be some logic to not playing e takes f4 as mentioned that it, things didn't seem to work that well for that e5 square in this particular configuration so sometimes it's a general rule you shouldn't you should be very cautious playing a move like f4 because of the e5 square but in that particular configuration the knights were not able to use e5 so it was fairly safe to open that second front and capitalize then on on the option of infiltrating via a7 so i hope you got something from that uh yeah comments questions like shares appreciated and have a good week yeah see you next week thanks very much